Good evening. Let's go right away into the Pastor Coverstone prophecy. I have had numerous requests from my office to make a comment on it. I did give it some time because I knew that there were other prophetic voices speaking into the situation. I'm sure you've already run across an opinion, but if you haven't heard yet, there is a viral uh, series of prophecies on YouTube from a pastor in Kentucky who uh, has had um, dreams that for him have been extremely troubling. And the, they basically have unfolded so far. And the main point is that in three month increments in his dreams, and he goes back into the dreams, a finger of God or a hand goes to the calendar and then boom, 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 hits certain months. And in those months, there's been this series of traumas that have come to the United States. So, um, Pastor uh, Coverstone, you know, says, uh, I believe they're prophetic. So I'm, I'm looking at my transcript here. So you know what I'm looking at. See, I'm reading verbatim. I trans had a transcription done. And uh, so I'm studying it closely. He says, I don't claim to be a prophet. And uh, then I believe I have a warning for the country. Now, this is going to be important. He's saying especially rural America. goes on to say that um, starting in January 2020, he was flipping through. Uh, he, uh, it was in the dream, the calendar was being flipped through. He saw January, February, and then the finger underlined March. Boom, boom, boom. And he believes like that was a signature time when we had, um, uh, I guess, the COVID situation. June was also underlined and tapped three times. Saw people marching in protests. And then, of course, that would be what we've seen recently. And uh, then he saw people that were um, very, very sick. And then courthouses, I saw new state houses, I saw people were mad and guns and uh, absolute chaos. He saw vultures flying over large cities. I saw smoke rising. I saw people fearful, looking out their windows from their curtains. And so then, then um, and that was, uh, let's see, that was for, um, yeah, the, the June three times. And then, and then he was looking uh, forward and had another dream. In December, I heard those words, brace yourself, brace yourself. Um, and the essence of that is that uh, he felt that particularly he saw September, October, November, and then a fist hit the calendar, boom, like on a third, and all these numbers were flying. He says that he reads upwards, not that he isn't informed, he reads up to 40 newspapers a day from around the world, from the left, from the right. Um, it's hard to know who to trust these days, he says. And um, there was a white figure that appeared to him, representing he thinks God. He heard a voice saying part two, and that was when he saw the figure come down, and that was September, tapped three times, boom, boom, boom. Then I saw November, then my Fitbit, he says heart rate went to like 180, boom, 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 boom. And he wakes up, because when that, he saw a fist ball up and hit the calendar, and the calendar exploded, and the numbers went everywhere. He saw protesters were armed, fighting in the streets, people pummeling one another, businesses shuttered and shattered, schools closed, people falling off the wall and felt like no one had been in these places for months. Banks with the roofs flown off and the money vacuumed up and money is flying out the roof and politicians in back rooms making deals and patting each other in the back and laughing. I saw Washington burning and blazing and fires and saw Chinese and Russians, the UN and uh, the United States and these vultures and gargoyles 10 to 15 feet tall and uh, it, was, it was quite traumatic, all this. And so, and then, you know, he had another dream like recently this week about hyperinflation. And he believes that there's gonna be a second wave of COVID hitting in September, major chaos in the country, troops in the cities, and um, make sure you have an ample supply of guns and currency. I'm not trying to depress you that haven't caught the prophecy yet. I'm just giving you what's there because you're gonna hear this. It's gonna, you're gonna hear it either from him or from someone else. Make sure you got an ample supply of guns and ammunition and uh, make sure you got communication links with your family set up. And Okay, so you got the idea. Now, uh, let me address a couple of things here that uh, are important just because, uh, I'm sorry I had to take you down this <laughs> edifying role. It's July 4th, I mean, it's a little bit of fireworks here, but um, he's saying it's gonna really catch a lot of people by surprise that aren't prepared and that the church's going to the olive press. So. Let's start by talking about one thing, and that is um, they're, they're, to address in, his, in, in the defense of people that see these things. 
uh, bad things. You know, the fact that something is, is, and I, you know, it took me like half a day to recover from this because, you know, ugh, I wasn't in the mood for it. And I'm working on this book I'm trying to do. And it's like, oh my gosh, I got hit again. So what happens is you watch this stuff and it just, it's like watching, sometimes I watch statues come down and my spirit just grieves. And so you feel in your spirit what's going on in the spirit atmosphere. As I was going through, I, I listened to the prophecy and then I transcribed it and then I studied it. And I, and I was thinking, man, it just has like this, this um, hopeless aftertaste, you know, in your mouth. And I'm thinking, what's the use of me writing what I'm writing? I mean, what, 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 if this is where it's going to go, then... And I'll, I'll tell you something. I do remember where Daniel had this uh, vision of the future. And, it, and literally, the Bible says it made him sick for like three days. I mean, it's possible to be a prophet and to see something and go, blah, and just be sick. I mean, imagine if you could see what was going to happen with the concentration camps in Germany or the gulag with Stalin or the Mao revolution. This is just in the last, our parents' lifetime, folks. So, you know, a prophet who could see that would be legitimately nauseous. But um, I, then I was encouraged, I was reading some things that other prophets were writing about this. And it's always good you get the other prophetic perspective. And I, I wasn't buying it. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why I wasn't buying it. Uh, because... Um, it's possible. You know, I can only watch. You, you think I'm a real news maven, but I'm very selective of what I listen to. Do not read 40 newspapers in a day. Don't listen to the left. I wouldn't listen to the left, uh, you know, anymore. I mean, listen, if you, can't, if, you, if you don't know what else to do, catch Rush Limbaugh when he's on and watch Tucker Carlson. Just two little dips a day. And, that, you know, just, and just tackle, get a little. Like Tucker's opening monologue. Boy, is he on fire right now. That's it. It'll just, like, it'll just like clear the fog out of your head, get you sufficiently um, traumatized to be able to go about your business and enjoy yourself. And remember this, I don't care what happens in the world. We have got to toughen up. I mean, the first century church went through Nero and Diocletian and Caligula, and the word of the Lord for them was, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. You don't leave your righteousness, peace, and joy because knuckleheads are in charge of government? I mean, my gosh, you know, you and I were blissfully unaware of everything political. But we, let's face it, we didn't, most of us didn't even get involved with this thing until Trump came along because we recognized after reading The Harbinger and uh, that uh, Hillary was going to be the judgment of God on America and everybody, for, for probably selfish reasons, was really mobilized to go listen to what the Lord were doing. Even the prophets of today are so smugly anti-Trump I won't call them out. Then a bunch of them were calling me on the phone before the election. Do you think Trump's going to win? Do you think Trump's going to win? Because they were worried about what was going to happen. All right, so here's the deal. The challenge I've got is that, um, and, it's, and it's not that the guy isn't dreaming. It's just that he's over-immersing himself in 40 papers. You don't need that much, man. You just, you know, you don't get your, you don't get the discerning of the Lord by listening to 40 people debate something. You just got to get a little sample. And there, boom, you get enough from the right source. That's all. Just get the right source. Take heed what you hear. Take heed how you hear. Because if you hear the wrong thing, it's going to get into your spirit. Period. That's what Jesus says. All right, so I'm a quick lesson here, please. You guys, you guys with me now? This is going to help you because you're going to have all kinds of prophets. Listen, we got false prophets. We got prophets in our group that are against Trump. I'm sorry to say it. I think they're knuckleheads, but I mean, you know, we got to deal with it. When it's time, we'll, we'll have to deal with somebody. But listen, uh, Keila, I want you to talk about this for a second. Keila, what's Keila? Well, Keila, other than a great sounding soft drink in Israel, is, is the name of a city. And David was uh, going to go to this city. Now, catch this. I'm going to tell you how this guy's dream can be legit and not going to be accurate. Now, listen to how this works. So, David knew that Saul plotted evil against him. Chapter 23 of 1 Samuel, if you want to be biblical in King James. And uh, David said, Lord God of Israel, your servant has certainly heard that Saul is seeking to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. Will the men of Keilah deliver me into his hand? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O Lord, uh, O Lord God of Israel, I pray, let, tell your servant. And the Lord said to him, I love this. Yep, Saul's coming down. And then David says, well, would the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, yep, they'll deliver you. <laughs> I love this. I love this about David. I love it about God. And it makes me jealous because we've got a better covenant with better promises. And, and when you need specific guidance to save your butt, I believe God will communicate to you probably through your wife. 
Listen, that's what happens in my case. So David and his, and his men, about 600, arose and departed. What this tells you is, you can get a sample of foreknowledge or step into what could be coming. And it is God warning you, don't do that. In other words, David, God wasn't showing him the future that was going to happen. You hear this? He was showing him the future that would be a consequence of the wrong choices. So I believe that uh, it's a vision of like, don't screw up. It's like, you know, there's a whole bunch of people. And I, and I have concerns about November 3rd because uh, I see it's a test. It's going to be a revelation of our condition. I don't believe this is going to be a victory for the devil. And I don't believe that, that it's going to, it's already in the bag. You know, when Joshua came before the uh, angel of the Lord crossing over to Jericho, he says, are you for us or for our enemies? Are you a Republican or are you a Marxist? And the angel said, neither. I'm neither Republican or Democrat. I'm, uh, I'm with the Lord now. Whose side are you on? You see, we shouldn't be thinking about this as a political issue. It never is. It's about where is God? But the problem is the people that are actually rabidly anti-Trump actually think they've got, uh, they're in a counterfeit revival. They're in a counterfeit awakening. They're under a deceiving spirit. And, 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 and so how do you know that? Because they're so certain. They're so fired up and angry and certain. It's always the innocent. I don't know if you know this. It's always the innocent, the sheep that are confused. It's like Israel, uh, halting between two opinions. Uh, Jezebel says this, Elijah says that. Jezebel says this, Elijah. Now they, so they're halting between two opinions and Elijah basically comes and says, if God's God, if God is God, then why are you serving Baal? What are you doing? It's like, snapped them out. So here's the deal. I'm not saying this pastor's having demonic dreams. Might be, but I'm not saying that at all. Why would I say that? He's having them consistently over a period of time. He's got a prayer group. He's got a church. He's conscientious. He loves the Lord. He seems to be totally sincere. I think that he's having a Keilah prophecy, which is, which is how bad it can get if, a, if the church continues to support the wrong choice. But you see, that was foreknowledge that wasn't predestination. Predestination is a little different. It's like, this is the things that God... So when God, when the watchers watched and decreed that Nebuchadnezzar was going to be seven years out of his mind or the finger was writing on the wall for, you know, uh, the, the, the many, many tickled apartheid, and those things come by decree. Those are things which God's determined they're going to happen. I don't believe this is a dream of a determination. And part of it is, I think, his advice on gold, guns, and head for the hills, and get your personal, I mean, I've known Christians for so long, I mean, you know, guys, remember the Shemitah? I don't even remember this, but the Harbinger was supposed to be about judgment on America, and it didn't come, Donald Trump came, and then the Shemitah was out, it was a best-selling book, and it was, I mean, everybody, all my friends, my good Christian buddies, were all like, you know, short in the market, expect to go down, ter terrible thing, you know, to be little, little George Soros, is anticipating disaster and trying to make a fortune, and it didn't happen, because God was gonna revive the economy, we always underestimate the mercy of God is my point. And we always believe prophecies of doom and gloom. In this sense, the American culture is very Jewish. Given the choice between believing something good's going to happen or something bad, uh, I believe it's bad, you know, it could be good, but you watch out, I swear to God, they're going to rip me off. It's a, it's a, it's a, my, my wife says it to me. She goes, what is it with you? It's like you, with the, the, the playing the octave. She calls it playing the octave. It's like ding, 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 ding. And it's, it's, a, it's a very Yiddish thing, I think, even though it's only part of me. It's sufficiently bad to depress me. Okay, so I'm not saying this guy's a false prophet. I'm saying it isn't a God prophecy. I believe this is the consequence. Now, part of the reason, the problem I have with it is here's the deal. Have you ever seen a conservative riot? Let's be honest about this. Liberals are always rioting. The left is always rioting. I could understand why we were so dumb, why we watched these people in, in, in Trump's rallies and they're screaming and yelling and cussing. And so how the heck could we, we be so passive? We are so apathetic. It's like the spirit of Ahab. Anyway, people are manifesting demons and it's activists. We should have known all along. These people are crazy. They're activists. They're wired. You, did you see, you got to watch last night. Just watch Trucker Carlson. He courageously parades in front of the whole world about like 10 people arrested so far, and he reveals who they are in their faces. Because they're, you know, they're constantly publicly shaming innocence. 
So he says, let's just find out who got arrested and who they are. And so he puts them up there. Every one of them is stark raving crazy. And that's, that's basically the, the protest group. And you can see it. I'm not judging them. It's just like, I, 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 I. even two of them was a husband and, and wife lawyers. I mean, this is totally wacko. So, so this, is, this is what I'm trying to say. I believe that prophecies like that, that lead you to this, this self-preservation instinct of golden guns and, and food supplies, I get it. I totally understand it. But you have to stop and ask yourself, like in that prophecy, the part that didn't make sense, particularly, is conservatives don't really riot. Conservatives don't really, I mean, come on, we haven't, we've watched these disruptions. My point is we've watched these disruptions since 2016. We're too, in a sense, docile or dumb to say, what's going on? That concerns me. We just, oh, well, another bro does, oh, it's probably Donald Trump. And why are we thinking? This is the nature of the volatility of the movement we're up against. Now it's out of the closet. But uh, to this day, you're not seeing conservatives, you know, running down the street. What would they blow up? They're not going to blow up businesses, obviously. They're not going to blow up, you know, government buildings. The conservatives don't riot. And evangelical Christians are the worst rioters in the world. We run around free hugs. That's our idea of going to a riot is give people hugs. I'm telling you, that's exactly what we do. That's, that's a ministry I know. So if, if Democrats win, you're not going to have widespread businesses busted up and fires and anarchy. They're going to be celebrating. They're going to be popping the cork on the champagne while they hit their final iceberg while they're going. They're going to be like Delta Shazar, praising the gods of Antifa and Black Lives Matter and whatever else got them the victory, even while the finger of God goes, uh, 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 uh. So, you know, it's not going to be, we're not going to be out there breaking things, because we don't. We never do. And, um, and besides that, you know, when, when, when evil rulers are put in over nations, that's how God judges nations. He gives them bad rulers. Um, but you know what I've said, and I've said this all along. I said, I believe that, this sounds weird. I believe that America is beginning to experience the judgment already, that our, our savings was wiped out. Our, our employment was wiped out. Um, this virus that came from China, because the dragon is rising, it's a principality, it's the next world power, and it had to reach out and take America, take the eagle down. And uh, so I'm watching the economy, I'm watching the jobs, I'm watching the plague, I'm watching the unleashing of this race wars, and then worse yet, the Christians that are under deception, bowing, taking a knee, trying to placate the mob, thinking if they could just show humility and solidarity. They don't realize they're being played because it's a Marxist playbook. You're not going to gain time and win friends and release the anointing by cooperating. Ugh. But as I look at that, I say, Lord, is this to be judgment? But Donald Trump is in office. If he wasn't there, I'd be saying, well, okay, so... Maybe this is going to be like the Christians. Remember when great persecution broke out against the church in the book of Acts? What happened? The Christians scattered everywhere. Maybe it's time for American Christians to start going into other countries. Not that we're really going to help them, but maybe uh, maybe, maybe it's a dispersion. Uh, and I thought, no, no, no. We're not really, it's not like the fire is going to go to, you know, to these other countries because, they're, let's face it, Iranian Christians and Chinese Christians are in probably great, far better fit shape than we are. No, I don't think that's what God's doing. I think that God is saying through this prophet, you better wake up and understand what's on the table. You better look at the consequences of what's there. And I believe these judgments have already started, but I think that it's just like what God did in Haggai. What did God do in Haggai? Why am I writing a book? Because I can't get the message out. Nobody's listening to me and it's driving me. Driving me, driving me to a place of reflection. Because what Haggai said, was, have you considered how your blessed peace and prosperity just left? And why? Because you're all doing your thing and not my thing. I want a different church. What God basically said was, I want you to build my house. Implication, there was lots of houses being built, but it wasn't God's house. I think God's trying to build a church. I don't think he's trying to build the one down the street because for all I know, half the shutdown was going on was God saying, I'm disrupting that also. 
everything stops, including the weekly gatherings with the with the uh, with the church. Now, I'm not saying God's against the church. Obviously, the church is the answer. It's a different house he wants. And that is legitimate. But that didn't get the job done. That let America slide over the cliff. That, I'll give you the, the data, most of the churches and the most, most of the pastors and the biggest, most successful churches avoid controversial. When was the last time you heard a sermon on homosexuality, transgenderism, um, or, um, or, uh, or socialism is theft? <laughs> Guarantee you didn't hear those things. But uh, guess what? Your sons and daughters have been indoctrinated. They've been discipled vigorously. They get it from entertainment, social media. They get it from school because the college professors are jamming it down their throats. And well, I think God says, I want you to start building a different house. I want you to build my house. And the house that God builds is big enough to start to rise up and cover America in a different way. It's gonna activate the body of Christ in a different way. It's gonna mean every member is gonna be activated in a different way. I don't wanna get into that now. I just wanna tell you, we're about to go from good to great because to make America great, God's gonna build a great house. And there's gonna be a reformation in the church and the wrecking ball is hitting the church. It's not Donald Trump's fault, but he is a wrecking ball. Kabam! The Liberty Bell, my friends, was cracked. But it still rings. Where's my little Liberty Bell? I used to have a Liberty Bell here. No, I don't know. Anyway, the Liberty Bell still rings. So, even with a crack. July 4th, Abraham Lincoln gave a statement in 1861 in the second crucible America went through. This is our fourth crucible. He went through the, we went through the first one, the Revolution, the second one, the Civil War, the third one with the Great Depression, World War II, and the fourth one right now. And in the second crucible, the man who was a lot like Lincoln dealing with the same situation Lincoln had, which is red state, blue states, and the blue states want to su succeed from the Union. They want to shut down the economy. They want to destroy the United States. They, they, they don't mind hurting people. If they can create enough chaos, if they can create enough chaos, they can say, America's on the wrong track. We need to change. That's why they want chaos. That's why the governor's willing to do it. By the way, Black Lives Matter, all the money that goes there goes into uh, Check Blue. Check Blue is the Democrat um, fund disbursement source for all the Democrats. So Black Lives Matter is a wing of the Democratic Party that is dispersing the money back. So that money's probably gonna come back, channel back into those very mayors and cities and states where they're defying Trump and trying to take down the economy. So it's kind of like a rigged game. But uh, there's something they haven't anticipated and that is the mercy of God. The mercy of God is merciless. That sounds like a conundrum. But the mercy of God is merciless with the things that get in the way of the mercy of God. You want to see God in his violence get in the way of his mercy. See, when God is being generous and God is being merciful, um, no one can stop it. You know, Stalin was about to, you know when Stalin died? Stalin died just a few days before he was able to execute a Haman-like purge of Jews in Russia. And there was advanced war warning and intercession was intensely going up. Now, nobody was praying for his death. They were simply praying for God to intervene. And God's intervention was to give mercy to his people and to take out Stalin. And that's what happens. The mercy of God is nothing to play games with. And I believe we need to be praying for a severe mercy. A, a, because God's mercy isn't just for three years for America. It's just unfortunate that we're not waking up because the awakening is for us, not for the unbeliever. Please don't talk to me about revival and a harvest. God isn't, God isn't interested right now, and it's not going to happen. During times of intense um, social upheavals and political um, emotions, revival doesn't flourish. Revival always comes before a war and after a war. We're in a war right now, so you're not going to see revival in a harvest. People are too excited and distracted. Just read Finney. I mean, it's basic revival 101. After there's a revival, before there's a revival. Why am I saying that? Because the awakening that God sent to the Jews was judgment in order to get their attention to get them on God's project. Then when the Jews focused on building God's house, awakening happened to the Jews that repented. The repentance is for us, not for the progressive Marxists. If we repent, if my people that are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. And so if God's people, so let's not talk about America repenting. America doesn't have to repent. You and I have to repent. What do we have to repent of? I think we need to be asking the Lord, in what ways have we traded off the, um, the bold 
investment of ourselves in supporting this president in building America and in fighting for the inheritance of what God gave us. How have we pushed that aside, ignored it, and justified theologically our withdrawing into our own little world? And uh, I know somebody's going to say, well, what about the poor and what about the widow and the orphan? I'm going to suggest to you that nothing is stopping any of us from doing that. My wife has brought furniture and, and jobs and um, intervention and the courts and er eradicated police records to over like a hundred different kind of families, all of them minority, all of them. Um, I don't think there's one one white family there. I think I think, and it's all by divine appointment. People just come to her, and she, I ended up, we don't have to get a warehouse because people are giving her stuff. She's giving it away. She just got a throughput ministry, a blessing, blessing families. And I'm saying that because people talk piously about, well, Lance, you know, you're talking about politics in America. What about the poor? Hey, man, nothing's stopping you from doing that. I don't talk about it. I keep telling my wife, I need some pictures, I need some videos so I can show people. It's hard to describe, but it's just every day, every day we do it. Just. Whew, it's the spirit of the Lord. And now we got to get a moving truck because we got, she's got a moving truck. She's always, she's got moving trucks. And where girls don't have jobs, um, we, 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 we find, we work to find them jobs. And where they can't, don't have cars because they can never afford one. Guess who's paying for Uber so they can go to work? Hallelujah. So that I can get them driver's license eventually. I'm saying <laughs> nothing's keeping you from being a force to be reckoned with in any direction except the lack of imagination. And so I repent in Jesus' name for, uh, for wasting time. And I ask you, Lord, to make me sharper and more effective in the future to be part of the house you're building. I pray for divine appointments for all my friends that are watching right now, that we will be drawn stone to stone. It's a, we are living stones coming together as a habitation of the Lord, and each one of us is going to become drawn to other people. And that, Lord, you're going to increase the anointing that comes out of the communion of the saints. The handful of relationships that you have, those stones coming together, are going to be containers for the anointing. It'll increase your ability to hear God. And when you pray with those people, your prayers will have such authority in their effect because the angels have assigned to you those prayers. And you'll be praying out the very things that God wants to make manifest in your life, amplified by the power of agreement with people that the angels have brought together in your life. You're going to be lining up with God like never before. And I believe that America's greatest days are going, could be, possibly be during its most distressing days. Remember, it was during the plagues that hit Egypt that uh, the land of Goshen was peculiarly visited by God's hand and his mercy. May we align ourselves so that we can be a model of joy, not anger, a model of composure and not craziness, and a force to be reckoned with, both in getting results the world can get with the things they're trying to do, but also the singular conversions of God. Lord, I pray that you're going to strike into the enemy's camp and by the mercy of God, get the ringleaders. Get the ringleaders like Saul of Tarsus. Give us ringleaders, Lord, and have them come out and shake us up and tell us what they were doing before they came to Christ and how we got to wake up and, and get, get on with the, the activism of the Holy Ghost. Remember, the book of Acts is a book of activists. They're activating the anointing. Well, share this with your friends. Do not be distressed. Don't be distressed by the prophecies that you're hearing. Trust me, they're like Kaila. They're, they're, they're people saying, oh my God, this is coming. It's boom, September, boom, October, boom, November. That ain't a, um, a, a predestined event, my friend. That is somebody reaching into a realm and seeing, you know, what, what could happen if God's will is not done on the earth. And what does it do? It produces in you this, it produces in you a concern. Where I think the prophecy misses it is, it hasn't happened yet. The watchers haven't decreed this. God hasn't said, and that's what I'm going to do, because that fist. Probably not the way God's delivering his message. Because all judgment is redemptive. It's to serve a purpose. And mercy triumphs over judgment. Remember that verse. Mercy triumphs, and three and a half years for Trump? I don't think that's a severe mercy. I don't think that's the demonstration of God wringing out the cup of mercy. I think we've exasperated him. I think we deserve judgment. And all mercy is a suspension of a deserved punishment. Let's get that clear. But man, mercy. I think it's a mercy of God that he's let us get shaken up the way we are. 
I think we've seen our fear with the pandemic. Oh my God. I was watching one night. I was watching, who was it? Oh, you know, the guy that go, used to go out and do the interviews. Anyway, I was watching one guy and uh, he was talking about, don't touch your face, don't touch your nose, don't touch your eyes. This is how the virus, man, I would tell you what, I was thinking, you know how dogs have those cones on their heads so that they don't scratch? Um, I was thinking I should put a cone on my head. I keep on scratching my nose. And uh, and I was washing my hands. I mean, like I, like I had a Freudian obsession. Wash my hands, wash my hands, wash my hands. It was so stupid. Because I, I watched one news show with a guy. He was just, and this was, a, this was a Fox guy. You gotta be careful because we were all under fear. But then I thought to myself, my God, think of this. You're Pentecostal, man. The doctrine of laying on of hands. We're not supposed to touch each other or shake hands. The fundamental doctrine of the church is laying hands on, kabam, like that. I thought, what the heck's wrong with me? Our condition is wimpy, 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 wimpy. And then I was thinking, aprons, Paul's schwetzing, he's waking, he's waking, he's schwetzing, he's wiping the schwet, he puts his aprons in his butt, people are taking his sweaty aprons and they're sending them out to their friends, boom, demons are coming out, COVID virus is leaving, all because the anointing on transferred to a cloth, a sweaty cloth. And I said, what's wrong with me? What's the wrong thing? What's, what is wrong with me? Well, I tell you what, COVID revealed our panicky impotence, our lack of Pentecostal confidence and vigor. Our laying out of hands almost went out the window. Hush. Then we're not supposed to meet. We're afraid of the government. Meanwhile, protests are out in the street. They're, they're jumping on top of police cars. They're burning things. And, and there's, you know, uh, what they did. You know, there's, you know, there's CNN and the Wolf well, Blitz. So, well, look at this. It's just okay. I mean, everybody's out in the streets. Meanwhile, Christians are cowering. They, the governor of New Jersey, what, on, what a stunad. He's sitting there saying, well, you know, we, we had to open up the liquor stores. Well, why, Tucker says, uh, because, well, they were meeting behind, you know what I mean? They were meeting in the liquor stores anyway, so I figured we figured we better might, might as well make it legal. We don't want them drinking in the back of the liquor store. Oh, so let's get this straight. People were drinking and partying in the back of the liquor store, so we decided to just make it legal and open the liquor store. That way they wouldn't be getting together. Christians, in the meantime, weren't allowed to meet in church in New Jersey. Maybe if they were meeting in the back and in sufficient numbers, the governor would say, well, listen, they're, gonna, they're meeting anyway. We might as well let them meet because that was his logic with the ding, dang, flipping state stores. Can you believe this? In other words, the state stores were breaking the rules, so we might as well legalize it, but the Christians, dutifully and beautifully, and obediently huddling themselves together in their basements, watching the TV, waiting for a green light to go back outside and breathe. I think these judgments have been good because they're waking us up. They're waking us, even right now, it's not done yet. Are you getting awakened to what's going on in America? Are you seeing this stuff and it doesn't, you're just like, it's like, I'm so irritated with the extent of the paralysis and the, and, 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 and the, and the decay and the depravity of, of local governments. And then in Washington, can you believe it? Did you guys call Langford yet? And the other guy, what the heck, where the heck are we? They're going to remove, what are they going to remove? They were removing Columbus Day. They're going to take Columbus Day off the calendar. You watch. Then they're going to start the Columbus Day, and then they wanted to put Juneteenth into the calendar and take Columbus Day out. They're bowing to the mob. They're bowing to the mob. I pray to God, hit Langford. The guy's a Christian. You should know better. Kabing, kabing, kabing. See, I think he doesn't like Trump, and everybody that doesn't like Trump that's from Washington is, you know, I think they just open themselves up to needless attacks from the devil. Anyway, I got that out of my system. And I uh, hope you enjoy this. I want to share this with your friends if, you, if you're willing to educate them on, on, uh, on this prophecy, if they've heard about this prophecy. And like I said, I'm not talking bad about the guy. I'm not saying he's a false prophet. I'm saying that sometimes people that admit that they don't know much about prophecy, they have dreams, and they can't distinguish between predestination and foreknowledge of something and obviously God was in des making it a destiny for David to get turned over to Saul because he was warning him by telling him what happens. That's what I think is the most redemptive way I could deal with that prophecy is to say, I'm not saying it's a false prophecy from the devil. I'm saying it's the guy looking from 40 newspapers and reflecting and praying and getting, where's this going? Yeah, the money is sitting sucked up in the air and, and there's craziness in the streets, but uh, I don't think Christians... 
are going to be rioting. Conservatives aren't going to be rioting. Cities aren't going to be up in blazes. But you know who would be upset? I'll tell you, the Democrats are going to lose their dang minds. If Trump wins this one, mamma mia, it's a spicy meat the ball. But here's the thing. And I probably should save this for later. We're going to wrap up with this thought. I had this powerful thought tonight. I think it might be inspired. It might be a God thought. And it was, you see how the left is mobilized? Don't tell me that there aren't millions of us out there going, where are the leaders? Where, why are the mayors doing this? Wait, wait, are you telling me they're actually allowing this? Are you telling me they're part of this? you telling me the Democrats are actually funding this? And, oh my God, I'm not, there's, believe me, there is millions of us that are not saying, oh no, where are they going to come for me? I'm watching that couple last night trying to defend their house, can't get a security team. Listen, after that Tucker broadcast, all they got to do is put their phone number up there. You know, Tucker, I'll get a hold. I guarantee there's a bunch of believers, if nothing else. We'll stay over your house. Your house looks pretty good. You got a bread and breakfast here? Why don't we just kind of stay here? I'll tell you, we'll pay 100 bucks a night and we'll just hang out here. It'll be fun. I know. I know that because I know Americans. And here's what I was thinking. You've seen the worst that the left can do. Bunch of kids and uh, intermingled with paramilitary operators, operators from Antifa. That's what you're looking at. You have no idea, and they have no idea, how many more millions of resolved conservatives and Christians are who can mobilize and make themselves felt. And you know what? You don't even have to be violent. Mobilization is going to be very unique in the next chapter of American history. These corporations that could care less about you while they're trying to buy off goodwill with the activists, you wait till two million people send them their pink slip. Wait till three or four million say, we're not buying your stinking product. How's that, tiger? And then they go and invest in a competitor who uh, refuses to play politics. All we got to do is organize. We can crack a whip that will cause that corporate America out there that has betrayed its own, its own shareholders in order to play politics to protect their brand. You watch. All that it takes is mobilization and confidence. And then, bam, overnight, it's like having a million people show up in Washington. It can happen. I know. I know America, and I know the people that are out there. It's just we're stunned that there's that much weakness in the layers around Donald Trump, that much weakness in the Republican Party. And it's pathetic. we got to drag their sorry carcasses over the finish line in November. But this is the last time. This is the last time. In the name of Jesus. Glory to God. By the way, you say, well, thanks for getting off of it. Let me tell you something. Watch this. Ready for this? John Knox. Knock, knock, who's there? John Knox. You know what he said? Give me Scotland or I die. His prayer was for Scotland. Mary Queen of Scots said she feared the prayers of John, Marks, John Knox more than all the armies of, uh, of her enemies. The truth of the matter is John Knox was a reformer. We got to get some Christians that said, give me America or I die. Give me this country. You know why? Because the nations belong to Jesus. They don't belong to the devil. They don't belong to the Antichrist. And we're not getting out of here. That's not our strategy. They belong to Jesus. We'll talk about the rapture and everything else later. I totally believe in it. I believe in an overcomer's rapture, not a wimpy, wiped out rapture. I think he's looking for a radiant bride, not some sloppy chick that's dressing for other guys. Knock, knock. Who's there? John Knox. Catch you guys later. God bless you. Thanks for joining me on this broadcast. And, you know, we could stay connected together. If you subscribe, you're going to be updated on the next broadcast that comes out. And you could like this right here, and we could actually start to create a movement of connected people.